and good morning to uh, to everybody. Uh, welcome to this second day of uh, this virtual colloquium on the resolution of financially distressed financial institution. My name is Clément Gascon. I am a senior counsel at Woods, which is a litigation, arbitration, and insolvency boutique in uh, Montreal, where I do advisory work and arbitration after some 17 years as part of the Canadian judiciary. I'm chairing this first panel of the day to kick off our second day. Uh, our subject is the principles uh, informing cross-border resolution of financial institution. Cross-border will be a feature of some of the discussions that we're going to be having today. Two panelists that we have to animate our discussion. First, uh, Dr. Janice Sara, better known to most of you as simply Janice. She needs simply no introduction. Since I met her back, I think in 2003, she has been at the forefront of any reflection pertaining to insolvency and restructuring, be it in Canada or abroad, and today is no different. Our second panelist is Alexander Borneman. He is the head of the Department of Insolvency Law at the German Ministry of Justice and Consumer Affairs. He also represents Germany at the Uncitral Working Group on Cross-Border Insolvency Law. He has had a lot of involvement in terms of assisting and drafting resolution laws as well as insolvency laws. And I turn to you, Alexander, to kick off our discussion uh, following with uh, the slides that we're going to be going through for uh, our participants. Alexander. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to uh, start with the first slide as I, the next one, uh, as I think a good starting point to reflect on principles governing uh, cross-border resolution is the so-called uh, trilemma of financial regulation. Uh, formulated by Dirk Schoenmaker a couple of years ago, which holds that um, it is not possible to attain three of the major goals of financial regulation, uh, which would be to let financial markets integrate across borders, uh, to maintain and preserve financial stability, and at the same time to uh, preserve national sovereignty in terms both of uh, regulatory uh, sovereignty as well as fiscal sovereignty and independence. Um, any two of these aims can be attained at the same time, but always at the cost of the third one. Um, so uh, if we look back, it's uh, pretty uh, good uh, and possible to uh, let financial markets integrate across borders um, and uh, to maintain national sovereignty when it comes to the regulation, to the supervision, and then to the resolution of financial institutions. But what uh, happens then is what we could observe uh, like uh, 15 years ago, uh, that it is uh, likely that uh, the system might collapse or become unstable. Thus, uh, in some, the, the financial trilemma, or the trilemma of financial uh, regulation seems uh, more or less uh, to call for the establishment of some sort of uh, transnational uh, architecture of a transnational uh, governance mechanism for the regulation, uh, supervision, and also the resolution of financial institutions uh, in distress. That, of course, is a, a, a counterfactual ideal, and um, it's uh, quite impossible to attain uh, in the near future. Um, although in Europe, uh, with the establishment of uh, the single resolution uh, mechanism and uh, the centralized uh, supervision by the European Central Bank, uh, the, in particular, the euro area has uh, make, made a, a, a substantial uh, progress. But uh, you know, on the global uh, level, um, that is something that is uh, not uh, likely to occur in the near future. Although, of course, um, worthwhile to 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 try to to attain. But anyway, uh, for the time being, a pragmatic approach is needed. Um, and uh, as I think, uh, the, the foundational principle for for that. Uh, for the task to be accomplished in that uh, sense has been laid out by the uh, Financial Stability Board's key attributes, um, uh, which consists, I think, of three layers. The first one being that it's important and uh, uh, 
uh, important to uh, devise coherent and convergent uh, sets of um, uh, resolution powers so, such that uh, every um, authority uh, has the same tools available to deal uh, with a failing institution. On the second uh, level, it's important to uh, devise a framework for a coordinated use of these tools um, and these powers. And that would also include uh, not only the delineation of uh, jurisdiction, if you want, uh, the, the, uh, the powers, uh, the allocation of powers among the various uh, authorities, but also recognition mechanisms. And then uh, third but not last, um, a, a mechanism for the sharing of losses and burden. And that I think the third layer is uh, one of the uh, key ones because the first one are familiar to us uh, if you are a bankruptcy lawyer or an, an insolvency lawyer. That is something that is pretty familiar that uh, the harmonization of insolvency laws is helpful and then uh, mechanisms for the allocation of jurisdiction and the recognition of uh, um, decisions. That's uh, key, but I think uh, what makes um, uh, resolution a little bit special also in the context of cross-border uh, context um, is the burden sharing because it involves money and it involves uh, public households or uh, quasi-public households. So that would be my first uh, thoughts uh, to when approaching uh, the question, what could be uh, the principles that uh, that govern um, the uh, the uh, or that should be uh, informing cross-border resolution. Thank you, Alex. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, uh, oh, this slide I haven't seen. Alex, did you put this one in? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, but I was too Alex quick. And, uh, I think it's it's you're it's done. done. Okay, let's move on for another one. Um, so it may seem silly to be talking about fairness as a fundamental principle, but I think it is actually important, uh, particularly in framing the discussion for the rest of the morning, to go back to first principles in terms of what the system design should look like. Uh, we had a very cogent analysis by Don Bernstein yesterday on the lessons learned from the global financial crisis. And now we're at a stage where we could helpfully design models that would actually allow for cross-border cooperation, put the tools in place prior to there being another meltdown of the financial system. And so fairness, in my view, in our view, uh, I think is a fairly fundamental principle. And it's not just uh, procedural fairness, it's also this notion of substantive fairness. And as Alex has just said, one of them is this notion of uh, protecting the integrity of the financial system. But the other is this idea of burden sharing or balancing multiple interests that are affected by a financial institution's distress. And as we all know, unlike company failure, which does affect multiple stakeholders, including employees, pensioners, creditors, trade suppliers, um, financial institution failure can actually affect huge numbers of people in terms of uh, depositors and policyholders. Next slide, please. On the, on the procedural side, some of the basic fundamental principles are this notion of accessibility, so that people understand their rights and responsibilities on bank failure or insurance company failure, uh, transparency of the process, the fact that it has to be very timely, uh, and that hopefully supervisory authorities have early intervention uh, before um, a bank or an insurance company actually fails. Certainty in terms of understanding the laws and then accountability by the decision makers that actually have um, oversight of the assets of our financial institutions. Next slide, please. So here's the um, the final slide and the one we, we want to focus a little bit on, and I'll say a couple of things and I'll pass it back to Alex also. Um, for me, one of the principal priorities is the protection of bank deposit holders and insurance policy holders as much as possible. And what that means is that we really need mechanisms in advance of financial institution distress uh, so that there's cooperation among supervisory authorities across jurisdictions. We saw in the financial crisis how the assets were uh, 
implicated across borders um, and that um, people that thought they had safe savings, in fact, uh, lost their life savings. Um, we've had a lot of strengthening of mechanisms as Don Bernstein talked about yesterday, uh, but nonetheless, when it comes to cross-border cooperation, it's incredibly critical that we have those mechanisms in advance uh, prior to failure and then have, as Alex referred to, at uh, their disposal, um, a minimum harmonized set of tools and powers so that everybody understands how to deal with the allocation of, of uh, both debt and assets. Um, the last thing I wanna say is, uh, is, before turning it back in our very short introduction here, is that there's been a lot of debate in the insolvency community about territorialism versus universalism. And realistically, I think that this idea of modified universalism, which is used a lot in connection with uh, resolution of uh, distressed companies, um, is not just uh, a way station, I guess. Uh, I think it really needs to be considered the actual goal of an effective cross-border resolution system for financial institutions. I think you can have a harmonization of the principles, a harmonization of the tools, and then how they're applied to really um, protect and preserve to the extent possible domestic choices about what the framework should be. So with that, um, I don't know if uh, Alex wants to add anything. Yeah, I'm, um, I would like to pick up one, one issue, the protection of deposit uh, holders. I think there's a strong interlinkage between resolution regimes on the one hand uh, which could be defined as those sets of tools that are needed to address the uh, financial difficulties of a financial institution and the protection of uh, bank deposit holders. Uh, there are several models how to, how to combine both aims of protecting deposit holders uh, and, 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 and resolve uh, financial institutions uh, insolvency. So, uh, uh, what, what, what I was found, found uh, interesting is the uh, American approach, and maybe it's a similar approach in, in Canada, where uh, there is a uh, institution in place that uh, acts both as uh, an insurer of uh, deposits and at the same time as a receiver for, for the bank, and then has the power to uh, to, to govern uh, the process of resolution. Uh, that is a, um, a different model than, than uh, the model implemented, for example, in the resolution directive uh, for, for Europe, uh, which does not necessarily or not uh, involve uh, the, such a role of the deposit uh, uh, insurance uh, or, or protection scheme. But I think uh, the protection of depositors is a key, uh, is a, is a key issue. And um, uh, the, the question is, however, how to... Uh, how to realistically and reliably uh, ensure that deposits are, are protected. And you might know that in Europe there's a discussion uh, ongoing that maybe uh, uh, as, as, a, as a missing link for the perfection of the banking union, uh, whether or not there should be uh, a centralized uh, pan-European deposit uh, protection scheme in place, which uh, of course uh, is also uh, a difficult a political uh, task uh, because it involves then um, all the sorts of problems associated with burden sharing ex ante and ex post. So in Canada, as we heard yesterday from Bob Sanderson, on the banking side, uh, it is it how the both the resolution authority and the deposit insurance um, fund are housed in the same entity with broad powers to do almost over the weekend resolution uh, plans for for failing institutions. On the insurance side, and I won't preempt the insurance panel that's coming up later this morning, uh, it's a bit more complicated, but the resolution authority uh, itself uh, comes out of the regulator and there's a deposit insurance, uh, 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 sorry, a, a policyholder insurance protection fund, uh, which is uh, funded by the industry directly and um, a board, an independent board elected by the industry. Uh, but here again, that, um, as a major stakeholder, as a major potential claimant in any failure of an insurance company, um, that organization, which is called Assurus in Canada, has quite a normative role and also a legislative role in terms of trying to prevent insolvency and trying to figure out recovery plans. And then ultimately, if there's a failure, a role in working with the liquidator on uh, actual uh, resolution. 
Right. Then a last thought, uh, picking up your point on uh, the no creditor worse off principle, which I think is uh, an important point and it links the, the matter of resolution or the issue of resolution to insolvency law because uh, the comparator in a resolution situation will more often than not be the insolvency of the institution. And uh, thus, uh, it appears that uh, also on a cross-border basis, and that's also something uh, that is uh, an issue discussed at the European level, um, that differences in the insolvency regime, in particular as regards the distributional uh, waterfall, uh, may have an impact on uh, the coordinated use of resolution power at a uh, transnational level, because uh, depending on uh, the, uh, the insolvency law and, uh, and the waterfall uh, to be followed uh, on the basis of insolvency law, uh, it will be necessary to compensate uh, creditors or depositors for the losses they incur in uh, the course of a uh, resolution action, or it um, uh, sort of controls the, the, the possible ways the resolution action can be designed because the creditor no worse principle, no worse uh, uh, principle needs to be complied with. So uh, to make a, a long story short, uh, I think it's not only about harmonizing and ensuring convergence uh, uh, of resolution tools, but many other things uh, need also to be considered and uh, in the best case, uh, harmonized, such as deposit uh, uh, guarantee schemes uh, and uh, insolvency laws. I, fi I find the discussion, if I may jump in, interesting because when uh, we listen to your thoughts on principle, it seems to me uh, pretty clear that the role of any adjudicator in this kind of process comes pretty late. Clearly, there is, I think, a major effort that needs to be focused in terms of be it legislator, be it regulator, in order to bring potential solution way before the matter needs to be uh, adjudicated. And that in the cross-border aspect of all these uh, uh, resolution, what is important is to provide the tools to adjudicator to indeed facilitate the assistant, facilitate the cooperation, facilitate the harmonization. And this is where I think adjudicator have somehow a role of facilitating the process in the hope of getting to the need to educate and decide the disputed issue the latest possible in, uh, in, in the whole scenario. And I think at the end, that is indeed quite beneficial. And uh, when we're talking about protecting deposit holder, protecting policy holder, protecting stakeholders, I think that's a thinking. Uh, that has to animate, uh, animate sorry, any reflection on these kind of resolutions. So Clement, uh, we're in our last minute of our panel, but I think you have set up the next panel perfectly uh, because the idea of the next panel is how do we conceptualize a model law that yeah. allows many of those tools and decisions to be made in advance with the judges, with the courts being the ultimate um, arbitrator where there is conflict between systems, but as much as possible to make sure the mechanisms are in place so that the courts can be only, um, not there's a last resort, but certainly as a, uh, a, a stamp on the integrity of the system. Uh, so from my end, thank you. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion for the rest of the morning. Well, as you just so well put it, uh, that uh comes put to an end uh, our participation of our first panel. We've tried to set out some of the basic principles. I now turning the panel to my uh, good longtime friend from the Canadian judiciary, Justice Barbara Romain. Barbara, it's now up to you. Thank you. Thank you, Clement. It, uh, it's lovely to see you at, uh, at this colloquium. Um, all of the speakers on our next panel are uh, members of the Bowen Island Group. Um, uh, the Bowen Island Group was named, as you heard yesterday, after an idyllic uh, uh, island off the coast of British Columbia in Canada, where we find that we do our best thinking, um, and we actually do our best eating, drinking, and singing as well. Um, 
sadly, uh, Bowen is uh, currently uh, covered with smoke from the tragic uh, Oregon and California uh, fires. Um, the Bowen Island group, uh, as well as the panelists here, uh, includes uh, myself, Professor Janice Serra, Professor Don, uh, Ron Davis, uh, Riz Moko, and Monica Marcucci. Um, we, what, uh, we've undertaken uh, the daunting challenge of uh, proposing principles uh, for a model law uh, that will set out a framework for the cross-border resolution of uh, insolvent financial institutions. Um, recognizing uh, that the efficacy of uh, resolution measures often depends on their cross-border effects, we're attempting to build on the extensive policy work uh, that uh, has been done in this area, such as the Financial Stability Board key attributes. And focusing on uh, the implementation of many of those general standards, um, including those uh, principles described by Dr. Sarah on the last panel, um, we are, uh, what we're presenting today to you is the core of our project, the results of our discussions and debates so far. We hope that perhaps not today, given the um, uh, limits of time and format, but soon uh, participants in this colloquium uh, will provide us with their suggestions and comments and even criticisms. Uh, we're going to start with Dr. Ignacio Tirado, uh, the Secretary General of the International Institute for Unification of Private Law. Um, Dr. Tirado was formerly a senior consultant for the World Bank um, and a director of the International Insolvency Institute. Ignacio is known internationally for his involvement and assistance to policymakers in the development and reform of banking and insolvency law uh, in multiple jurisdictions. However, since the pandemic, um, he's been forced into languishing in his palace in Rome. Um, Professor Tirado will uh, will provide background on the landscape of global CIFIs. Um, we'll then turn to Dr. Stefan Madias, um, who is a professor of civil law, civil procedure, and insolvency law at Martin Luther University in Hall, Wittenberg, Germany. Um, together with Professor Bob Wessels, uh, Stefan led the project on the rescue of business and insolvency law uh, of the European Law Institute from 2013 to 2017. He has prepared policy analysis on preventive restructuring fundamentals for the jury committee of the European Parliament. And he's a member of the uh, expert uh, group reporting to the German Ministry of Justice for the reform of German insolvency law. He's also a director of the III and he sings a mean 99 lift balloons on occasion. Uh, he'll discuss institutional framework issues that arise in the design of a global approach to banking resolution. And finally, putting it all together and discussing the model law uh, that we propose is Dr. Irit Mavorik, a professor of international um, commercial law at the University of Nottingham and the founder and co-director of the Nottingham Commercial Law Center. Dr. Mavorik has been acting as an expert advisor to the UK government's delegation to UNCISTRAL. She's been a senior counsel to the World Bank, heading the bank's global initiative on insolvency and creditor debtor regimes. She is a prolific writer. Her most recent books are entitled, The Future of Cross-Border Insolvency, Overcoming um, Biases and Closing Gaps. And of course, as a member of the Bowen Island Group, micro, small, and medium enterprise insolvency, a modular approach. Uh, Irit is a wonderful uh, colleague, but has the irritating habit of sending uh, the rest of us her draft chapters before the deadline date. So uh, we'll start with you, Ignacio. <laughs> Thank you, Justin Romain. Thank you, Barb. Um, I should start by saying that, um, highlighting that, uh, irritating attitude of Professor Mevorak indeed. Um, uh, also that um, um, I have, um, contrary to what's been said, I have no palace in Rome, I'm indeed speaking from Rome, but it is the uh, seat of the uh, UNISRA 
uh, which I most certainly do not own. Uh, and um, I'm not going to be representing Unidra um, in this uh, brief intervention, but rather myself as an academic, as a professor from Madrid, and a member uh, of my uh, most dear uh, project, which is the Boeing Group with my dear friends, uh, whom I um, really sad not to see in person. Thanks to the International Insolvency Institute and to the University of British Columbia and its Faculty of Laws, uh, and to everyone who is still listening to this uh, for paying attention. So um, my, my intervention um, will be preparatory uh, for the uh, presentations that will follow. What I am going to try to do um, is present a, um, a picture of uh, what's ahead of us, uh, which is a very bleak scenario, I'm afraid to say, um, one which calls out for um, some uh, active measures of coordination and cooperation, and therefore which makes uh, the Boeing project and the drafting of model law more important uh, than ever. Um, generally, um, I will divide this into different stages. First of all, um, I'd like to mention the um, a current uh, strong level and high intensity of uh, still uh, in the globalization and the interrelation of the, of the banking sector. And we can see this in different tiers. And the first one, which uh, is pretty evident, is uh, concerning the um, interbank uh, market, both in its inter interbank lending uh, part and its um, uh, forex or uh, exchange rate uh, uh, market. Um, they're uh, both uh, extremely important for the uh, financial sector internationally, um, and they uh, actually um, have proven in the past to be extremely uh, sensitive to, uh, to crisis. Uh, in, in his excellent speech, Tom Burstein yesterday signaled that the um, main problem for uh, bank insolvency is not really balance sheet insolvency, but rather liquidity issues that arise uh, earlier. Um, well, and the um, problems of liquidity, banks not lending each other, not uh, adjusting currency between each other uh, in the short term or mid term markets um, is uh, one of the uh, fora, uh, one of the markets where uh, lack of confidence and liquidity makes liquidity dry out earlier and therefore uh, has a high volatility. Uh, and the dependence of the financial sector on the interbank uh, market um, is still very high. Um, further, uh, recent analysis conducted uh, by the uh, Bank of International Settlements and other research centers have proven that um, the uh, well functioning of the uh, interbank uh, market actually depends to a, a great extent uh, to the uh, trust of the uh, domestic banking system. Um, and given the growth uh, um, of banking systems in developing countries and middle income countries, this adds indeed volatility to the situation. The scenario is also um, quite uh, um, intertwined, interrelated concerning uh, the, what's more generally called as financial markets. That means financial derivatives and, uh, and related markets. Um, they have continued to grow. Uh, and while the 2008 crisis uh, sparked an, uh, a series of, of improvements and, and um, measures that contain um, the um, risk, that those are uh, most likely uh, still insufficient. Um, not all the issues that uh, caused the 2008 financial crisis have been solved. Let, if we look, for example, at places like uh, regionally, like uh, the European Union with the um, European market infrastructure regulations, the prohibition of native CDAs trading and other, other measures, the situation is better, it's easier to track, uh, for example, who, who has the, the securities and the bonds. Um, nevertheless, um, that is only a regional uh, situation and uh, it remains to see what happens outside the European Union and uh, from a global perspective, there is so much OTC trading that um, the volatility and the risk remains. Um, it uh, is also very important to highlight um, that sovereign debt markets um, have a direct uh, and extremely uh, relevant link with uh, financial sectors. As you know very well, um, 
countries finance themselves uh, with the money of, uh, of, of financial institutions and therefore financial institutions hold many, many assets um, of uh, sovereign debt um, and, and that creates a um, link between both which actually uh, can be pretty risky. Uh, so this is the general situation. Um, everything is in place but financial stability can crack anytime unless uh, adequate measures are implemented. How is this going to look now? Can someone please move on to the next slide? Uh, the, uh, how does the um, banking sector look, which is what concerns us, although our project is not only for banks, but uh, ask why it encompassing as possible. First of all, and interestingly, there is uh, a, a strong tendency towards uh, bank concentration. Um, for example, according to data from the European Banking Authority, uh, since uh, 2009, more, almost about 2,500 uh, financial institutions have closed in the European Union. Uh, there is a strong tendency towards consolidation um, of financial institutions, in good part uh, due to the uh, reduced profitability of the banking sector and the strengthened um, uh, competition created by online banking and fintech. Um, so uh, the way to confront this has been to, to get together and strengthen the, uh, the institutions. Uh, of course, what, what this does is this creates a tendency, since institutions grow, um, to internationalize their business, uh, which also uh, allows them to diversify the portfolio. Um, so um, th there is not only a tendency to bank concentration, but also to increase internationalization in their activities. Um, um, also, interestingly enough, um, another very interesting paper from the Bank of Inter International Settlements um, has uh, shown us that um, both in uh, developing and middle income markets, um, there is an increase in the internationalization of banks, uh, in part because it uh, adds to their strengthening uh, and therefore they can access financing costs at a lower level. So there is also an increased cross-border activity by uh, lower income uh, countries, uh, which is naturally also another uh, situation which could add volatility to the picture. Um, there is also a, a great increase in the issuance of debt in domestic currency, also for developing and middle income countries, which is something which didn't happen before. Um, and that also adds volatility. Um, and a fourth uh, item which I have uh, forgotten to add to the, to the slides, and my apologies for that, is the huge uh, growth of online banking and the fintech sector, as I said before. Um, of course, this is a type of banking which sees no borders. Uh, and much of it is uh, unregulated and much of it is also unsupervised. Um, and therefore, that adds um, a level of uncertainty also to the cross-border banking uh, scenario. Um, that is the picture before February and it would continue to be to some extent today, although I don't have updated numbers. By the way, I, I would be happy to provide the um, uh, quotes and references to the articles I made reference to. However, we are in and uh, will unfortunately um, have to be for a little while on a, a COVID situation. Um, and this is uh, a quite unique uh, situation. This is unlike the previous one, uh, the, the um, 2008 crisis was a very important crisis uh, in many parts of the world, but it was not a fully global crisis. Some countries actually were, uh, left the crisis better off than they did before. This is, however, a truly uh, global crisis. Um, and uh, even the countries that have adopted measures which are not so stringent on the economy are suffering nevertheless, almost in the same level, uh, the, the degree of economic shrink uh, as uh, the rest uh, of countries have, ad have adopted more stringent measures. Uh, and this is because um, it is export countries, uh, those rich and those that export commodities and uh, from developing countries that are suffering the most because of the uh, lockdown and the downturn of the global economy. So everyone's suffering for this, from, from this. And not only, unlike also then, not only is everyone suffering from this um, generally is also suffering from the uh, problem at the same time. Because uh, even though the sickness spreads from one place to another uh, within weeks or even months, 
Uh, nevertheless, the economic downturn is taking its tolls almost sim simultaneously in every uh, country. So um, the current situation affects the real economy severely um, and also immediately the public sector uh, for obvious reasons. Um, so although to a lesser extent initially um, these problems didn't affect directly the financial and the banking sectors, uh, obviously they already are and they are inevitably uh, going to spread even stronger to the financial sector uh, for a number of reasons. Um, obviously uh, and evidently uh, because the um, downturn in the real economy and the economic crisis in the corporations uh, create a, uh, an evident problem of uh, non-performing loans for banks and uh, the uh, economic crisis creates um, lower tax returns to states which in turn have to make increase their transfers to, um, to the economy. Uh, therefore, the state has to pay more and receive less. Uh, and at the same time, the banking sector, as I said before, holds a terrible amount of sovereign debt in their, uh, in their balance sheets. Uh, if the bonds, the sovereign debt lowers in value because of the insolvency or the financial distress of the countries, automatically the assets of the banks also decrease in value and the crisis is automatic. Uh, so um, we have this perfect storm which affects all sorts of, uh, all, all sides of the economy, uh, which make life very difficult. Can you please move on to the next slide? Thank you, thank you. So we are in the middle, I'm afraid, of what could be defined as a uh, perfect storm. Um, the, um, what we have to do with this storm um, is not easy. Uh, first of all, uh, we have still insufficient coordination mechanisms between central banks, um, especially outside the Basel and, uh, and FSB framework, therefore, especially concerning um, banking sectors of less developed countries. Um, there are improved coordination mechanisms as uh, if we compare them to the ones that were in place in 2008, but the situation is still far from being optimal. Um, there is also different levels of uh, implementation of uh, and adequacy uh, in, uh, of capital requirements and other regulatory um, uh, requirements. Uh, as also Don Bernstein uh, rightly mentioned, the situation is much stronger than it was in 2008, but that is all, only true for some countries uh, and the size of this crisis might not make this um, sufficient. Uh, so the TLAC, the M, M, e, M rel, rel, or how you call it in the European Union, um, sorry for the strange acronym, uh, might not be uh, enough. Um, still, unfortunately, also outside uh, reduced, uh, limited realm of regional integration like the European Union. Uh, outside that, there's still uh, quite uncoordinated back resolution and insolvency tools, especially when it comes to implementation, um, especially, especially outside the realm of the um, global CFIs and the key attributes of the Financial Stability Board. So for those 35 entities, I believe it was, um, we might um, see some uh, good solutions in place for the rest of banks, which, and there are many with an international component. Things are far from clear and far from sufficient. Um, and uh, the uh, reference to the flexibility problem posed by Don Bernstein yesterday concerning the TLAC uh, of a corporate of a banking corporation uh, co group of companies um, is a very good example um, of the uh, needs that are out there in terms of coordination and cooperation. So uh, adding all of that together, um, we really are in need uh, for a, a treaty which is politically unfeasible. So uh, the soft law instrument, which most directly resembles a treaty, uh, which would be a model law, uh, a model law which allows for streamlined coordination and implementation of resolution measures, also for planning um, of those measures. Um, let me just conclude by saying that um, such a model law will have to be designed, uh, bearing in mind perhaps uh, one psychological trend, which is what concerns at least me the most, which is uh, the um, um, temptation that many countries will have to act parochially uh, 
uh, and short, in a short-sighted manner by thinking they will be pr protecting their national interests um, when um, the solution to this crisis needs to come from a widespread consensus and uh, from giving up a little bit of sovereignty otherwise. Um, there is no uh, solo uh, getting out of this. Um, so the model law will need to uh, fight against or, and provide instruments to make sure that uh, this um, selfish uh, national interest um, attitude, which will be present, no doubt, uh, is tackled to some extent. Uh, sorry if I've spoken a little bit more than I was uh, asking to do. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ignacio. I think it's my turn now. Right. So here we go. Um, yes, yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, that was in the final remark. Let me just quickly uh, get to this because I can't really ignore it. There is uh, the Spaniard living in Italy talking to the German uh, about uh, some sort of burden sharing. And we've just heard that uh, it's been extremely difficult to even come up with a European deposit insurance scheme. Uh, so I think the challenges will be much more severe. Um, at the same time, of course, you have to remember that um, the, the tax revenues are shrinking in large dimensions, also in Germany. So I think uh, these talks are going to be hard, and I hope um, the right uh, framework will help um, see the benefits and uh, help also by uh, initiating some, some downsides if you stick to a very national uh, perspective in this. And this brings me to, to the slide you already see. I, I'm going to take my 10 to 12 minutes to, to talk you uh, through this slide. And we start at the, at the left side. Uh, with the failure. Um, so our idea and uh, our task that we took on ourselves was not to reinvent the, uh, the, the bank resolution regime. What we try to address is the cross-border aspect of it. But of course, it's not isolated. So um, we need to connect to the existing frameworks on bank supervision and bank resolution. And although they might not be perfect in our eyes, um, the, the whole endeavor is um, not to, to revise them uh, to a greater extent, but to, of course, adopt a cross-border or uh, suggest a cross-border regime um, that is also um, setting the right incentives uh, to use the frameworks that still differ significantly across jurisdictions to the right extent to move um, decision makers to the right uh, direction. So. First up, uh, the failure. So um, the first thing you have to address in a cross-border resolution regime is uh, you have to identify home and host jurisdictions. And um, this is what we do initially um, and uh, what we have to do initially. And we connect to the supervision regime and to the existing bank resolution regime um, by acknowledging that there is already a home uh, because banks and financial institutions are all supervised to some extent depending on their size. So there is a natural uh, connection uh, to those uh, authorities um, in the supervising jurisdiction who assess and determine a failure of a bank or a financial institution. So the first uh, step there is almost naturally to, to um, review whether a home jurisdiction should always be determined um, by that assessment, by that authority, or whether there's still room for something that we used to do and we still do uh, in bankruptcy uh, frameworks, which is looking at Comey. And uh, this is the first basic decision that needs to be made for a cross-border resolution framework, whether we still look at Comey or um, another connection um, to identify the home jurisdiction. The second uh, thing then what comes up is uh, once a failure is determined, um, there is a resolution framework often in place um, whether it's a specific resolution framework or whether it's a common bankruptcy framework. And we learned yesterday from our American scholars and colleagues that uh, it might even be both, depending on the size of a financial institution or the type of uh, business they do. So um, the next step then is to look at the uh, resolution uh, framework. And what's interesting for us on a cross-border perspective is the decision-making process, because the final decision 
in this that comes out of this uh, framework and, um, is the one that should and has to be recognized or not recognized uh, in other jurisdictions, in host jurisdictions. So it's natural to first look at uh, the way these decisions are made. And um, there are different aspects to be looked at. The first aspect is the decision-making process itself. So we need to, of course, recognize that this decision-making is governed by um, the legal framework of the home jurisdiction. Uh, it is to be done under very limited information available in a very short time frame uh, in which the decision is usually made. Um, this is the typical uh, in the time frame of a weekend or whatever uh, decision. As we learned yesterday from the experience of the Lehman uh, bankruptcy, sometimes overnight. Um, at the same time, it happens when market situation, when the overall market situation is not perfect, it tends to be rather volatile. We, we have the experience when Lehman failed, we have had the experience in other situations when um, there is rumor of a bank failure. This is not something that calms markets down. Uh, asset prices may deteriorate, deteriorate quickly and as uh, Riz explained yesterday, that might have contagious effects on others. So the expectation would be to calm markets down quickly and uh, to help others even only by this step, by reassuring markets that everything is in control. And the last thing is um, that we see a continuation basis, uh, bias, a continuation bias in favor of at least continuing essential services in a failing financial institution. So payment services and other services need to be continued as far as possible. So there is a certain bias compared to uh, a regular bankruptcy in favor of continuation in some form. Then we need to look at the decision makers. The decision makers are different and have become different within the past 10 years. Um, it used to be courts, especially bankruptcy courts, um, who made a decision about the, um, the adoption of a plan or uh, other measures. Um, it used to change. So now we often see resolution authorities. We see in many jurisdictions, public authorities in charge and competent to make the resolution decision. Um, and this changes, at least from a cross-border perspective, uh, the focal point. Uh, we are not talking uh, cross-border recognition of judgments anymore. We're talking cross-border recognition of a public authorities decision. That might be very, something very different. We also look at uh, uh, the way this decision is made, uh, the way other institutions are involved. Um, we see sometimes government officials, elected officials being directly involved, as we learned yesterday from the Japanese uh, scheme where the government is directly involved in the decision-making process, similar things we've learned from Italy and other jurisdictions. Um, of course, the natural point of uh, interest there is to look at the coordination and cooperation with foreign officials in that um, moment in time, because if other uh, authorities are involved anyway on the local national level, it would seem to make sense to extend that cooperation already to the authorities in, juris uh, in jurisdictions where we need a cross-border effect of the decision of the resolution and measures that will be adopted. So um, there is the uh, possibility maybe, even there is a short time frame, but there might be the possibility to involve foreign um, authorities, especially on an authority and authority basis. So uh, on a direct connection between authorities, uh, coordination might have a positive effect, uh, especially because uh, recognition, foreign recognition can be facilitated if those responsible for the recognition are already involved and have their voices being heard. But we also recognize that, that there can be a disadvantage to early sharing of information across borders because as Nacho just um, mentioned, there is a tendency for national um, authorities to ring fence to protect the national interest and uh, the early sharing of information might lead to actually just that, to a quick ring fencing and um, so the end of any cooperation and recognition cross-border effect. The third pillar we're looking at um, on the home jurisdiction side is, of course, judicial review, because once the decision is made, the resolution plan is adopted, 
Um, there is often a judicial review available based on constitutional law. Um, so there will be some sort of uh, court involvement, even if there is a resolution authority acting. And uh, we've noticed that, um, of course, due to the time constraints and the need for, um, uh, for certainty, as we learned from uh, Janice's slides, as a basic principle of fairness, um, we see that often these, uh, the, the grounds for judicial review are uh, limited. We see that they are often limited to, to objections based on scope, based on jurisdiction, and based on very principal objections regarding fairness, um, um, yeah, discrimination, proper representation. Um, so this will be part of our assessment as well. Why is this important? Because if we come to the right side of the slide, it is important in order to design the perfect cross-border framework. A cross-border framework requires uh, requires a host jurisdiction to accept whatever a home jurisdiction does. So it is a legal basis for accepting some sort of a loss of sovereignty in order to um, accept what other sovereign authorities or courts have decided to be the, the right way to do it. Um, whether this is actually a surrender of sovereignty or just a form of cooperation based on sovereignty is something our uh, scholarly this discourse can, can uh, endeavor on, but uh, this is what we're looking at. So um, we're looking at ways to involve certainty to the cross-border aspect of a bank resolution. And the first step to recognize there is that uh, legal certainty at the moment is very bleak. And this is based on the assessment I just made, that we replaced court judgment very much uh, with public authorities' decisions. So we moved away from the traditional uh, foreign recognition of a judgment, maybe even in a civil uh, court, bankruptcy court, and we moved towards rather public um, administrative decisions uh, and asked them to be recognized abroad. And um, in contrast to civil law or uh, um, trade law uh, judgments, there is hardly any customary um, law on the foreign recognition of administrative acts. So we need a legal basis there. We actually need to introduce um, legal um, duties to act for the uh, authorities or the courts in the, in the host jurisdictions that we need for cross-border effect of resolution measures. So this is the outset. So how to ensure that? Uh, and how should these legal rules look like? Um, from the institutional side that I'm looking at, um, we first have to question uh, whether there is actually the need for a institutional involvement uh, on the side of the host jurisdictions. So do we actually need any authority in the host jurisdiction to formally decide on recognition? Or would it be possible to have recognition be simply statutory, fully automatic, without anyone in the host jurisdiction involved in formally assessing it? Um, we see a similar framework within the EU based on an internal market and a lot of confidence, at least in our uh, EU legislation. Um, but this might be a step far too far for many other regions uh, in the world. And it has reached some uh, roadblocks even in, within the EU. So the second question would then be, if we need an institution to decide formally about recognition, um, which institution should we um, see competent to do so? Should it be courts or should it be authorities? Um, should it be one central way to recognize or should it be left uh, decentralized uh, to be decided by those courts or authorities who are asked to implement resolution measures on the ground? So to recognize that that has been written off if a claimant still files a claim for 100%, it would be the court uh, who would need to recognize that there has been a valid foreign uh, resolution measure writing down debt, for instance. Um, that would be the question that would, it, would need to be answered there. Uh, it could be courts, it could be one court. Uh, we could also as well see something like a chapter 15 proceeding central, centralized um, uh, deciding about the recognition of a foreign, juris, uh, foreign jurisdiction, jurisdiction's resolution. Question three would then be, if there is some sort of resolution uh, recognition duty, what are the limits to it? So we need to define limits um, 
based on substantial principles. And as Janice described earlier, the principles would follow from the fairness uh, assessments made earlier. So there needs to be procedural fairness as well as substantial fairness. And this is where the cross-border resolution framework plays back um, into the resolution frameworks that already exist because it gives a hook to foreign host jurisdictions um, to have a second look at what happened in the home jurisdiction. And if there's an issue with fairness um, based on public policy um, assess assessments, there is a ground for refusal. We would probably suggest that these grounds for refusal are limited and clearly defined, so not as broadly determined um, as a principle of fairness, uh, but much more clearly defined. And I guess uh, Edith will maybe touch upon that a little later. So that's recognition. In our view, that's not all, because once you've recognized a foreign resolution measure, it gets effect as if it would have been taken by the home uh, resolution authorities. But we would uh, suggest a third thing that is um, finding an example in the European framework again, and that is to treat the damages claims of affected stakeholders separately. So we've learned from earlier uh, presentations that one of the key fairness aspects in any plan, bankruptcy plan, as well as resolution plan, is that no stakeholder is worse off under the plan than they would be in an alternative scenario, probably litigation. Um, and this is an objection that every individual stakeholder um, may bring forward on its own. So uh, they may um, litigate even uh, that uh, they are worse off than they would be without the resolution measure of the foreign or home authority, no matter where they are. So um, our proposal or our idea would be um, to have this objection not being part of uh, the, ju the judicial review on level one or the recognition um, determination on level two, but to give it a, a separate um, assessment in an, in an individual litigation. It could be individual, it could be a class litigation based on what's available under civil procedural rules in each of these jurisdictions. And for the time being, there seem to be good arguments that uh, this kind of litigation should be happening in the home jurisdiction, centralized, um, because it is basically um, a dispute about valuation. And uh, valuation should be um, the key aspect in this litigation. And in our view, there, is, there might be good reason that the valuation, the final valuation, um, these um, claims are be determined upon uh, should be made where the valuation matters. And this is in the home jurisdictions, possibly by the resolution authority um, and then binding for all of the stakeholders involved. That would, of course, be some sort of a, a burden for um, stakeholders in host jurisdictions. And um, it could even be complicated further by the comparator, as Alexander Bonnemann mentioned earlier, because the comparator might be very local um, based on the assessment that some of that happens, would, have, would happen in, in host jurisdiction. So uh, this is something we would like some input on, basically, um, to finalize our ideas there. But still, the basic overall institutional framework that we envision now at this point in the project is the one I just described. So we build our cr cross-border resolution framework on the existing framework, and we look at ways um, to uh, bring rules and mechanisms that make this not only feasible, but also setting the right incentives to search and um, pursue a cross-border solution rather than a national ring fence solution for national interest. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So against this complex backdrop of financial institutions operating across borders, and especially as Ignacio mentioned, the increase globalization, internalization, and concentration, interdependence within financial institutions, and also in view of the potential conflicts between home and host jurisdictions, as explained by Stefan, we started conceptualizing a model on cross-border financial institution resolution. And I will touch upon three quick 
key questions regarding this idea of a model law. Why a model law and not another international instrument, what type of model law, and how will such a model law reflect modified universalism? That modified universalism that Janice mentioned earlier, which is based on principles of fairness. And, and this model law is the center of our IIII sponsored project, and it is still a work in progress. So we would really appreciate comments and thoughts from you uh, on these issues. And you can put your comments in the Q&A box uh, uh, during this panel. We will save those comments and look at them also later in our deliberation. And also, if you are listening to the recording later, uh, do send us emails uh, regarding uh, with, with any comments on these issues. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, so, next slide, please. First, why a model law? Why model law and not another uh, international instrument? And why do we need an additional instrument? As we already have quite a few instruments that were developed, especially after the previous a financial crisis. As, as already mentioned by Ignacio, there is something missing in the system, in the global system. The key attributes and, and also the FSB principles on the recognition of resolution measures and the supporting mechanisms developed by ISDA, the ISDA protocols that were mentioned yesterday in several presentations, are hugely important, but they are not sufficient because they cannot, they do not provide a comprehensive uniform framework for cross-border resolution of financial institutions. The, the ISDA protocols provide certain contractual solutions for some of the for the recognition of some of the resolution measures. The key attributes and the FSB principles do not cover all the cross-border aspects uh, of a uh, financial institution resolution. And also they provide high-level principles, a global standard that countries that, that guide countries when they reform the laws and it can also guide the development of an international instrument like a model law. A model law can provide a uniform framework. Alternatively, we could create a uniform framework for cross-border resolution of financial institution through negotiating a treaty, but as, as sort of hinted by uh, Ignacio, that could be complicated. Negotiating and adopting a treaty is a cumbersome process, and especially regarding a sensitive matter such as the distress of banks and other financial institutions, the result of such a process it could be a compromised, diluted instrument. Also, internationally, we have excessive in, uh, experience in developing, negotiating, adopting, and applying model laws on cross-border insolvency to which a cross-border resolution is closely related. And therefore we adopt, a, we, we suggest that the model law is the right approach and we would appreciate comments on this question. Do you agree that a model law is the way forward? The model law that is informed by the global standard, by the key attributes and the related instruments, and also draws on existing instruments available on the regional level, and also uh, uh, on globally, especially the model laws on cross-border insolvency, the 1997 one, but also the newer model laws on enterprise group and on the enforcement of uh, insolvency-related judgments. Next slide, please. And the second question is what type of model law? A model law may mean different things. For example, there is a, a model companies act that is not intended for wide adoption as it is. We do refer to a model law that includes a set of provisions for enactment in legal systems with limited alterations so that it creates a uniform framework and after adoption it becomes binding, it is enforceable within the legal systems that participate in this framework, in this model law. Mainly, primarily, that model law would cover the cross-border aspects, the private international law of resolution. And here we think that we should be ambitious and try to cover all cross-border aspects. So not just provide a recognition regime or a cooperation regime, but a model law, a framework that covers all the cross-border aspects of resolution. In addition, we think that we should include in the model law provisions, a section that aims to harmonize, to some extent, resolution laws and measures. And by the way, when we say resolution within this model law, uh, we don't mean just resolution per se, just the resolution measures, but 
ways to resolve a financial institution, and that can also include a liquidation. So to some extent, to also harmonize resolution laws and measures within the model law, we think that this is crucial for the effective operation of this cross-border framework. But we think that this section might be more modular than the cross-border uniform rules, more modular in the sense that countries may adopt some or all of the tools that will be included within the section. For example, if a country feels strongly against a particular tool, for example, if we suggest substantive consolidation for financial institutions resolution in some circumstances, if, if a country feels strongly against such a tool, they may not adopt it, but still adopt the model law and be party to this framework. And again, we would appreciate comments on this approach, this idea that the model law would be of a compound composite nature, mainly a cross-border framework, but also including certain resolution measures to harmonize to some extent the, the domestic resolution laws. Next slide, please. Finally, how will this model law reflect modified universalism? It will provide a uniform framework for a cross-border resolution which is the essence of modified universalism, to resolve conflicts between uh, jurisdictions. And specifically, that framework will enable to centralize proceedings in the way that is most efficient, most optimal in the particular circumstances. And we think that centralization should be the default solution. Stefan started talking about this centralization should be the default solution, and not only for those structures that are akin to the single point of entry, the SPOE strategy, where there is a holding company and all the operations are on the subsidiary level. More broadly, regarding all financial institutions, the default approach should be centralization at the place where the financial institution was authorized, if it is a single financial institution, if it is a group of financial institutions, at the place, normally at the place where uh, the parent institution was uh, authorized, and where uh, the group as a whole may be supervised on a consolidated basis. So centralization is a starting position with the option that additional proceedings may be opened if it is most efficient or if the home jurisdiction doesn't attempt to accommodate the entire institution. But in the relevant cases, in the relevant cases, uh, centralization should be allowed and the host jurisdiction, the host uh, various aspects of the uh, of the institution whose jurisdiction should differ to the decision of the of the home uh, authority home or group home differ to those decisions recognize and support them cooperate and and uh, and even enforce orders and measures final slide please i understand that i need to wrap up so i'll be quick uh, this just gives you a general overview uh, of the model law uh, it's still work in progress under development so again comments will be appreciated you can see how we try to cover all the cross-border aspects it's not just the recognition regime it's not just the cooperation regime uh, it will hopefully include uniform rules on jurisdiction applicable law recognition support enforcement cooperation subject to safeguards uh, very clearly and specifically defined as stefan explained so that we don't easily resort to ring fencing and to territorialism and in the third column in the third section you see this attempt to also include certain resolution laws and measure to achieve a certain level of harmonization i will stop here and i understand that we are running out of time so the next slide is just to thank you and again to remind you please send us comments thank you thank you uh, all the uh, panelists and uh, just before uh, we send you off to Justice Georgina Jackson to discuss the uh, unique uh, features of cross-border uh, resolution of insurance companies, I just want to refer you to Dr. Ignacio's um, slide or headshot where behind it is the uh, building that he insists is not a, a palace in Rome. Anyway, Georgina? <laughs> it's not my palace, it is a palace. <laughs> Georgina, over to you. Hello, everyone.
Thank you, Barbara. My name is Georgina Jackson. I'm a judge of the Court of Appeal for Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan is one of the prairie provinces centered in Western Canada. As I have indicated, in this panel, we now shift specific focus to cross border issues associated with the failure of insurance companies. Uh, since detailed information is available on the website for the International Insolvency Institute, I will, with the, the permission of my panelists, introduce them briefly only. Uh, Professor Dr. Jens Gall, our first speaker, is a private lecturer with the Goethe University in Frankfurt, specifically with the Institute for Insurance Law. He's also the Secretary General of the German chapter of the International Association of Insurance Law. Uh, Ms. Marcucci is Chief General Counsel uh, with IVAS, the Institute for the Supervision of Insurance in Italy. She's been heavily involved with insolvency law research and reform, including with um, the Bowen Island Group, which we have heard mentioned yesterday and today, and ANSI Trail and the World Bank. Monsieur uh, Patrick Dilly is Superintendent Solvency at the Autorité des Marchés Financiers, the AMF, a, a position he's held since February of 2013. Mr. Daly has been chair of the Canadian Council of Insurance Regulators, and he's currently the vice chair of the Executive Council of the International Association of Deposit Insurers. Um, our speakers will try to follow the tight time frame we have established so as to permit a few minutes for questions. Uh, Ms. Marcucci's presentation will be a few minutes longer than the others, given the emphasis of her talk on reform measures. Uh, Professor Gal will set the frame. Ms. Marcucci will discuss reform. And Mr. Daly will speak to the on-the-ground work in Canada. So over to you, Professor Gal. Now, the subject of the panel is how recovery and resolution are handled in the insurance sector and whether or not reform, especially on a global level, um, is needed, well, potentially to create more coherence uh, to the banking sector. Now, this, however, implies that um, insurance undertakings should be treated differently from, from other undertakings, especially from the real economy. And such special treatment seems only proportional, well, if the protection of policyholders as consumers or um, requires such, or if an insurance, insurance poses, well, systemic risk. And the latter that has been traditionally denied um, and in Germany even fervently. So if you allow me to, to explain that, because for Germany, that was quite understandable, I would say, since for many decades, uh, there had been only one um, notorious bankruptcy of an insurer and that dated back to the Weimar Republic. And in that case, Allianz had um, assumed all insurance contract from the defunct Frankfurt Allgemeine Versicherung. So that meant there was no really um, negative result for the market. Now, shortly after the turn of the century, however, um, there came a um, insolvency of a large life insurer. And here, well, the pieces weren't picked up um, by the market. So that showed, well, the market cannot always self-correct here. Um, and this led in Germany to the formation of insurance guarantee schemes, one for life insurance and one for health insurance. Um, the same as, as mentioned this morning, as, as it is in Canada, those um, guarantee schemes, they are financed and established by the insurance industry um, itself. Still, this was only seen um, as a, an aspect of policyholder protection or consumer protection without admitting that insurance um, is systemically um, a risky business. Now, um, the change really happened um, in, the, in the wake of the financial crisis and the national debt crisis. And here, well, systemic risk well, garnered much more interest then, um, but still the focus was largely on banks. But um, as exemplified by AIG, it became evident that under insurance undertakings too may be the source of, of systemic risk and, and certainly are subject um, to systemic risk. Um, 
but, and that's really the point I want to drive home there, we need to notice that the, the systemic risk exposure of insurers is different from banks. Well, for example, um, uh, an event such as a bank run that would be rather unfeasible for insurers because uh, policyholders cannot uh, simply withdraw um, their money uh, at the blink of an eye. So. Um, things like the uh, resolution weekend that will not become necessary for normal insurers uh, at the very least. Now, the biggest difference between um, insurance um, uh, to the banking sector might be that the default even of a, sing of a, of a single insurance company, well, no matter the size, um, leaving out reinsurance companies that might be different, um, will hardly ever have a noticeable effect on the other market um, than its home state. And the reason for that is that insurance has remained largely a national business. Um, that means outside some, some insurance classes such as transport insurance and certain large risk insurance contracts, um, insurers will only insure within their home country and if they want to enter a different market then they will usually um, form or acquire a subsidiary. Um, and so this shows us that if there is systemic risk, then it will not emanate from the single insurer, but rather from the insurance group um, or the conglomerate to, to which it belongs. Um, and here there might be a systemic risk um, so that the instability of certain group members may infect the group as a whole, and that may then spill over to other markets. So there the, the cross-border issue really becomes um, eminent. Therefore, um, when identifying uh, systemically important um, insurers, the, um, uh, it, it's really we need to rather look at the group structure than at the single insurer and the, the sort of business in which it partakes. Um, and but within the group, um, different national approaches to recovery and resolution, resolution um, may of course create serious uh, risks for the group and thus for the global market. So that means where the parent company is to be regarded under the factors of size, global activity, interconnectedness, asset liquidation and uh, substitutability as systemically important, um, there is absolutely a need for a transnationally coordinated approach to the recovery and resolution, um, even of mere participating insurers. Um, now, in Europe, such efforts are being well, currently taken on the supervisory level um, within the supervisory colleges uh, under the auspices of the, the European um, Insurance Supervisory Authority, that is IOPA. Now, this, however, does not alter the fact that the member supervisors remain bound to national recovery and resolution procedure, um, which have not been fully harmonized and not fully, that's rather that means not been harmonized. Um, that means in case of a crisis, uh, the supervisors might see themselves faced with a choice between Scylla and Charybdis, um, either to disregard certain, certain national particularities or being unable to avert the crises. Now, several attempts have been made to mitigate these problems by initiating legislation to create a more harmonized framework for recovery and resolution for insurers but also for harmonizing insurance guarantee schemes. Such efforts are certainly not limited to Europe, but also undertaken on the global level. For the most part, and, and Monica, my, my next speaker, will speak about this, such efforts um, have not yet come to fruition. Now, in view of the ongoing low interest rate environment that poses considerable problems, at least to German life insurers with rather high guaranteed returns toward their policy holders. Uh, so this legislative inaction has been problematic for quite some time. And now with the advent um, of the COVID-19 situation, it has become dire. Um, here, life insurers, certain kind of business interruption insurers, credit default insurers, but also many others may run into liquidity problems if the situation deteriorate, deteriorates. Pardon me. Um, and uh, 
So it's really like pandemics, uh, vastly created systemic risks do not stop at borders. And just as the COVID-19 crisis has shown the interconnectedness of our respective countries, it has reiterated a lesson we hopefully already learned. That means that trouble rising in one market may relate to us all very quickly. So it's high time that we take a more coordinated approach. Um, that um, uh, concerning recovery and, and resolution in the insurance sector. But in doing so, we should not lose perspective um, and treat insurance always in the same way as banks, just by saying, well, it's a financial institution, so uh, it's the same as a bank, because insurers have long been subject to much stricter supervisory investment standards than banks and are for several insurance classes even required to form ring fins, safety funds for the benefit of their policyholders, additional um, funds. And this already lowers uh, profitability margin of insurers quite noticeably um, and to now treat insurers who are by these measures already less prone to insolvency under an identical regime of recovery and resolution that might uh, either result in the increase of premiums, well that wouldn't be great for all policyholders, um, but much worse might actually increase the likelihood of recovery and resolution procedures becoming necessary. Um, so it would really then that the, um, the solution uh, would actually be the cause, um, which of course uh, would not be a thing to be hoped for. Well, and with this, I conclude. Thank you. Georgina? Yes, and uh, now we will turn this over to Monica. I can't see your, your video, Monica, but that may be my computer. Can the, here we go. Very, can, very good. can other people see me? Because yes, it seems I can see you now. Sorry? You may begin. I, I hope my video is working. It seems functioning. Yes, it is. You may okay. begin. Thank you and thank you everybody for being here, for listening to this, to this panel. Um, I, I want to start immediately with the topic. I hope I will, I will use my time properly, which is not easy because there are so much, there is so much material on the table on this particular topic of the resolution of insurance companies. As Jens highlighted, not only back there, can we go to the first slide, please? Yes, as Jens highlighted, not only banks, but also insurance companies have been affected by the financial crisis, uh, or better, group of insurance companies have been affected, even if not only. And in particular, the failure of the insurance company AG during 2008 shined a spotlight on the role of uh, insurance companies in the economy, and in particular, on the potential harm that could occur if a large insurance company were to fade in a disorderly manner. The AG episode, but there were also other cases in the US and in the Netherlands, uh, have demos has demonstrated in particular how large, how, uh, how it can happen that large insurance company whose assets are held mainly in bonds and stocks can be exposed to shocks in the global financial market. And this is due to the fact that large insurance company used to be large investors in the financial market. And this is always more so in these recent times. According to a 2016 paper by the IMF, the, the IMF, the contribution of the insurance sector as a whole to systemic risk has increased even after the financial crisis and is still increasing now. And, and this is due to a number of factors, such as the insurance, uh, the fact that insurers are participating more and are more active in capital markets, and they, they have increased their non-traditional, non-insurance related activities. And this is resulting in growing links with, um, with the rest of the financial system, and also has created a number of commonalities across the financial market as such. And last but not least, there is also increased exposure caused by a wider cross-border operation by 
uh, insurers. And the SRB in its papers and documents has clearly illustrated the numbers of this growing interna internationalization of insurance company, companies. Uh, next slide, please. So what, what has been the response of regulators to this, to this phenomenon and to this awareness of the, of the fact that systemic risk matters also for insurers? Regulators and transnational policy makers seem to have recognized, first of all, the traditional tools like runoff, portfolio transfers and liquidations, which are the normal uh, crisis management tools used by insurers might not be adequate to prevent a systemic disruption in case of failure. And therefore, despite objections by many in the industry, even recently, in the course of the last five years, um, regulators have been taking a number of initiatives aimed substantially at promoting the establishment, the establishment of a harmonized special resolution um, regime for, for insurance companies. Uh, for instance, international bodies such as the FSP in the, in the first instance, but also in, but in particular the supervisory standard setter as the IAIS, which is the international standard setter for insurance supervision, have been tasked to develop a set of measures to mitigate these types of new risk or, or wider risk posed by insurers, uh, insurers. As to the IAIS, it has updated its core insurance principles, uh, setting for several measures such as uh, increased capital and prudential requirements. And in, nine, in 2019, it, this measures was also supplemented with the establishment of a new holistic framework for supervision, which has a specific focus on uh, group-wide supervision, of course, but also on effective um, resolution. But a crucial contribution to, towards the establishment of a uh, harmonized regime for resolution of insurance companies has been given by the FSP in 2014 when it supplemented the key attributes, the 2011 key attributes, with the inclusion of an insurance specific annex, uh, which gives guidance on how the application of the core principles should be, should, should be tailored to the peculiarities of the insurance activity and in particular how the specific the core principles should should be um, should be implemented in a way that ensures protection of policyholders uh, as a special category of, of, of consumers and of, of, of claimants that are typical of the insurance companies and finally in August this year therefore um, very recently the FSB the FSB has also finalized the key attributes assessment methodology for the insurance sectors which provides a number of very useful elements or to, to guide um, jurisdiction towards the, to the proper implementation of the key attributes in short what, what we can say about the FSB initiatives is that uh, it's construct it's, it's, it is construed around the core principles therefore it provides for the establishment of resolution authorities for the insurance sector. And these authorities should be equipped with a wide range of resolution of um, tools and powers, including the power to restructure and limit or write down insurance or reinsurance and other liabilities. And according to this framework, losses to creditors and policyholders should be allocated in a way which is consistent with, of course, the statutory hierarchy of claims, but also uh, su subject to the safeguards of the Paritasu and no greater loss of principles. This is this said very in, in, in short. Uh, but what about Europe? The establishment of a harmonized and effective framework for insurance company, for the resolution of insurance companies, has become a key topic also in the European Union, where the EOPA, the European Insurance and Occupational Pension Authority, is strongly recommending now, in, first in an opinion of 2017, and now in a, in a document which will be soon released, but was subject to consultation in 2009. It's strongly recommending, as I said, the introduction of new regulatory tools in the, um, in the, within the revision of the uh, Solvency II 
directive and therefore uh, it, it has proposed a number of, of specific provisions regarding not only recovery and resolution but also insurance guarantee schemes which which are marked by a very fragmented framework at the european level in general the approach suggested by eopa is that of a minimum harmonization directive similar to the brd directive with which many of us are already familiar which is aimed uh, as the fsb suggested in the first instance to adequately protect policyholders but also at maintaining financial stability in the EU. And this is the very important change which was, uh, which was mentioned by Professor Gao also in his presentation. Next slide, please. So if we, if we look, if we want to, if we, if we if we, if we could go into the details of this proposal and resolution framework, of course, we don't have the time here to, to specify and illustrate them. But what we can see is that the resolution framework for insurers is being shaped along the same lines of, of that one implemented for banks with only very limited departures that take into account the specific the specificities of the insurance sector, the insurance activity, and the complexity in particular of insurance balance sheets, as well as I said, the protection of uh, policyholders' uh, rights. But then would this approach mean that the, that the rules that have been conceived, conceived and designed for banks would be automatically transplanted to, into the insurance regulation? And in this re regard, I think that Professor Gao's concerns uh, are legitimate and correct. We, th this is an important question that we should ask ourselves. But uh, my preliminary answer would be no, I don't think that this is what is happening. Uh, because the transplant, if we can call it this way, uh, would only be really limited to those situations, no matter whether involving a large group or a conglomerate or a specific insurer that pose material risk in case of failure risk for the stability of the, of the system but also risk for the real economy and as it has been uh, exemplified and uh, illustrated very widely by the ESRB in, in, in a couple of important documents issued in the last couple of years. Both the FSB and the IAIS are, approaches are very clear in this respect. Uh, as we all know, uh, most of the key, key attributes apply generally to resolution uh, regimes for financial institutions that could be significant or critical if they fail. Um, and those, only those principles um, from 8 to 10 that regard uh, crisis management room, uh, resolution planning, uh, solvability assessment are specifically aimed at global, uh, globally systemic institution. And, but jurisdictions can still find them relevant for other insurers. This is clarified in, in, the, in the part regarding insurance companies, whom they may identify as critical. Therefore, there is an intervention of jurisdiction in looking at the very specific situations of single companies to understand whether this particular situation can pose systemic risk. And also the system emerging at the EU level is a sort of opting in system rather than a system based on exemptions. And, this, in my view, should allow both flexibility and proportionality of the measures to be adopted. And I liked it here to, to quote uh, a principle that, in my view, reflects the, this type of holistic approach, which is the principle, um, the guidance formulated in essential criterion 11.1 of the FSB assessment methodology. And it, it, re, it says that uh, the development of and maintenance of recovery and resolution planning is for insurers covered by the, this, this criterion that are not global takes into account the specific the system, globally systemic take into account the specific circumstances of the individual insurers including their nature complexity interconnectedness level of substitutability and size and the extent of cross-border operations therefore there is this broader view to what consists constitute insurance activities and what the, the very particular uh, risks that come from the various ways in which insurance activities can, 
Maybe this can be before. Next slide, please. So if we look now at more at the, at the uh, cross-border issues, uh, first of all, we, we have to, to, to note that there are various transnational insurers or group, or group structure that can create uh, cross-border issues. And um, these global insurers are, as a rule, are structured as a group with, with subsidiaries and activities in several countries, while across EU cross-border EU um, transnational insurance are more structured um, using branch as they find it is easily easy to enter other markets in the EU uh, through the freedom of services and establishment. And we have some important examples of this cross-border activity of insurance companies also at the EU level. And there, was, uh, there are data and studies showing that to some extent, if we look at numbers, uh, insurance company tend to be more international than at least large insurance company tend to be more international than uh, large banks. And this is an important aspect to look at. Uh, the, considering then for this, uh, the structures of, of, the, of the, uh, this organization of the insurance activity, both the EIAS and FSB standards have put great emphasis on the, on the importance of ex-ante planning and coordination mechanism within the crisis management group and through a specific coordination agreement, which are essential, essential forms of coordination for a success, successful resolution, uh, which takes place cross-border. But due to the particular uh, characteristics of insurance business models and products, which in general, uh, especially in the life insurance seg segment, allow a longer time frame for addressing problems than, for example, in the banking sector. Timely consideration of potential recovery, as well as resolution plans by both insurers and authorities are absolutely essential. Just to give you an example, let's think about how complex evaluation in a, in a crisis can be in order to apply a bail-in because the no credit was of principle and very difficult to be applied to the restructuring, for instance, of life insurance claims, given the difficulty to carry out a fictitious valuation in bank in the bankruptcy scenario with reference to claims that are at least in principle wholly or partly uh, dependent on not only a future but also an uncertain, uh, uncertain uh, event. However, what, what, what I would like to strike again here is that harmonization is a fundamental condition to, to gain, um, to achieve a good result in cross border resolution because um, coordination would be really difficult without dealing with at least the same or similar uh, rules. Next slide, please. And the importance to have a harmonized framework is particularly evident and high in a very fragile uh, market environment like the one we are living now, as already mentioned before by other panelists, with in particular as regards the insurance sector with prolonged long interest rates, which combined with a risk of sharp reversal in a surprise can lead to what, what is generally called the double hit scenario. And uh, this, in this scenario is, is, is could materialize, for instance, in particular with the, as I said already, with the life insurance sector, in particular for those life insurance that offered products with guarantee uh, returns at the time when interest rates were higher. And now, as I said, they are particularly uh, low. And if we look at the result of the AOPA stress test conducted in 2014, they showed that 44% of European insurers would not meet their capital requirements under the prescribed double hit scenario. And such an occurrence would have, of course, catastrophic effects over the banking sector, considering the role of, of insurers as investors, not to mention, of course, to the real economy of member states, given the, the high interconnection with, within the various uh, sectors. This scenario harmonization is a fundamental precondition. Uh, but what I would like to, 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 to add is that 
um, harmonization might not be the only uh, and the best solution. It would still need, the, there would still be a need for something more. So in, in this sense, the discourse tend to be the same as with the banking system, which, is, which has already uh, reached a, a high degree of, uh, of harmonization as regards um, bank resolution, recovery and, uh, and resolution. And um, given, uh, because it, what, what the problem is that even if, if a, 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 an acceptable degree of uh, harmonization is reached as to the uh, compliance with the, with the key attributes, which is not yet the case, because recent analysis show that uh, many jurisdictions are not compliant, and most jurisdictions are not compliant with the key attributes for the insurance sector. Um, um, ring fencing cannot be all fully avoided, and it's always on the, cor in the, the corner. In particular, if we think to restructuring measures, that could come into question that would affect insurance liabilities uh, related, for instance, to product lines that can be, might, might not be um, um, uh, systemic for a single jurisdiction, but could be of a strategic importance for the branch or subsidiary <laughs> jurisdiction. Then what, this, what the solution might be to these problems? The only solution would be, again, as uh, was suggested by my pre the previous colleagues talking about the banking system by the, uh, the elaboration of a uniform text, a uniform text that could be shaped along the lines of the Unsitron Monopo on cross-border uh, insolvency, because only this type of, of text tackling, reducing the room for, for <coughs> refusal of giving uh, effect to foreign resolution action could specify all the, the, the conditions that under which these uh, effects could be given uh, to, uh, to resolution measure uh, cross-border. And the importance is that uh, exceptions to, to cross-border effects of these measures should be very limited. And I personally wonder, or I think that we should ask ourselves the question in respect to the insurance sector, whether in addition to uh, exception like the financial stability exception, which is considered and promoted by the FSB with, in, as regards with the recognition of, of um, foreign measures, other exceptions could be considered. For instance, if uh, also real economy or consumer protections implications of the foreign action could be relevant in the perspective of the jurisdiction. Again, for the reason that Protection of consumers is still a very important part of the, of the insurance uh, framework. For, to give you an example, this case might happen, for instance, when the foreign action would affect the continuity of the, continuity of the insurance services provided by a, by a, a subsidiary. Yes, it is not uh, systemic for the group, but provides critical services in the host jurisdiction that cannot be easily substituted by policyholders. And we just, this is a case that may happen and may be frequent. Or we can think at the case of like, cases in which policyholders, um, policyholders' rights in, in, the, in, the, in the foreign jurisdiction would be sacrificed without having the same level of protection granted to policyholders in the home country due to the absence of or inadequacy of uh, insurance guarantee schemes in that jurisdiction. And this could also be happened considering how fra fragmented the framework of insurance guarantee schemes is in particular in, in Europe. This idea Monica, and the, uh, to, Monica, to the conclusion, Monica, yeah, just me, words. I think, I think we have to um, just take a few moments here to finish with uh, uh, Monsieur Derry. Uh, the time yeah, is yeah. so short yes. here. But I think what we have to finish with a few yeah. words from- Yeah, can I just add two words about the, yeah, about this, this idea of the model law might, might be very ambitious at the moment, considering how slow the harmonization process of substantive rules, at least in Europe, uh, has been so far. Uh, but we have to keep realistic and think that the, the clock is sticking, and especially with the COVID-19, uh, which is making the EU framework more fragile than before, it's very important to, to, to run towards the adoption of a common framework for the entire market because 
EU market because what we have to avoid is that rather than absorbing adverse shocks, the EU insurance sector may transmit and or amplify shocks to other parts of the financial system. Sorry for taking all this time and I'm finished. Thank you. Hello everyone. I don't know if you can hear me already. If someone, yeah, okay, I see you nodding, uh, Jens. So uh, you will have access to the PowerPoint presentation. You will be able to read it uh, a bit more slowly <laughs> than I will use it today uh, afterwards. And also, if you want to have more information, there are some uh, in useful links uh, at the end of it. So, so you, I will let you uh, um, use that document later if you want. Uh, for my presentation today, I'll try to do a five or six minute versions of it. Uh, if we can move already to slide three, please. Yeah, this one. So, so I thought it was interesting to uh, look at the issue we discussed today uh, using Canada as a, a test case, if you will, because since we are a federation, we face internal cross-border issues. Uh, for example, insurers in Canada may be incorporated under many legal regimes, however, they must have a license in each province and territory if uh, they want to do business in the, those uh, territories. So, so we have 10 provinces, three territories, and a federal government, hence the presence of 14 insurance supervisors in Canada. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here you have um, a mapping of the key players of our financial safety net. Uh, I highlighted in yellow the ones that are relevant to my conversation today, which is insurance supervision is done by uh, OSPI at the federal level, but we have a uh, 15 provincial and territorial uh, supervisors. Uh, however, for the protection schemes, um, for deposit insurance, those are um, you know, public sector organizations. However, for life uh, and health insurance and general insurance, as well as for securities, uh, protection schemes are private sector non for profit organizations. So, uh, for instance, for life and health insurance, it's called ASUVIS, and for the PNC insurance, it's called PASIC. Uh, and so, how do we uh, take this network and try to make sense out, out of it? And how are we able to manage the crisis from the crisis? Uh, well, next slide, please. Uh, we, simply, we simply look at the what are the best practices from international guidance? And you have covered this already in your colloquium, so I won't go back in, in depth into, into that material. But of course, having clear roles and responsibilities among the players, uh, having formal cooperation uh, and exchange of information agreements, high level of crisis preparedness, public awareness campaigns, that, that type of stuff is things we're trying to implement in Canada. So next, next slide, please. Uh, First question you want to answer is who does what, when? <laughs> but here you will have a timeline uh, going from green to yellow to red and back to green, which simply illustrates a company that is going on swim doing well, it's on the left green part of the timeline. Then comes the crisis event that, that starts, you know, recovery measures. If they succeed, perfect, the company goes back to the green zone on the left. If they don't succeed, well, that we go at some point to the resolution point of entry, and then you know there are various solutions that could be applied. You see on the top of that line, uh, I illustrate what would be OSFI's role compared to the CDIC role. Those are the federal organizations, uh, CDIC is for banking uh, protection team. Uh, and you will see that OSFI is responsible until the resolution point of entry, but CDIC starts to, uh, to be involved before that point. And if I use uh, the IED, the International Association of Deposit Insurers um, uh, terminology, we got that model and loss minimizer, and we will be able to read more about that uh, later. But uh, I, I illustrate that point because when we look at the insurance uh, protection schemes, historically, uh, our two schemes would only be involved, start to be involved at the resolution point of entry. So that infamous uh, Friday night announcement that th this company has gone belly up, and that's when you know those protection scheme uh, kicks in. Well, over the last few years, uh, we have noticed that both Asterisk and PASIC uh, are not aiming to to have this loss minimizer mandate, so to be involved before the point of entry in resolution. Uh, if we can move to the and this is a very key takeaway, I will come back to it in my conclusion. Uh, if you look now at uh, who does what and how, 
Uh, I referred to MOUs. So this is a quote from the one we have among the provincial insurance regulators that, is, that has been modernized in 2015 to explicitly refer to solvency supervision for entities doing business in more than one province. But if we go to the next slide, please, um, where I, I made a couple of um, quotes from the uh, guidelines we have between AMF and SOVIS. We have just updated them uh, earlier this year. The intervention guidelines have five, five stages, uh, four it, during which we think that the insurer is still solvent and then we, be, we believe it's insolvent. Already at stage three, uh, what, that we called watch conditions, you will see there that Assuris starts to play a role. And we agree that uh, Assuris may hire a restricting professional, uh, that we look at options. Uh, the AMF and Assuris may agree to set up a crisis management group already at this stage and invite, we could invite Assuris to participate in, in meetings with the insurers. If we go next slide at stage four, when we believe that solvency is seriously, seriously compromised, but yet the company is still solvent. Uh, if we decide to initiate the receivership order application to the courts, we will put a name of a potential receiver uh, that the SRS will provide us. That, that could be the professional that they uh, hired at stage three. So if the court agrees, the receiver would be someone who already is well aware of the situation at the company and already has thought about options to protect the, the, the policy orders and, and minimize the costs of the resolution or the restructuring. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, this is also very uh, interesting because uh, again, it's still considered solvent and as the risk could use its resources at that stage you would have to decide if they want to, to provide financial support to the receiver using a, lots of various uh, options that are put on the slide. Uh, so that again, the, 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 the solution to the crisis could be dealt with with the help of it as soon as before entering into resolution. And stage five is of course the insolvency and then as soon as would take over and, and bring it uh, under the Rounding Up and Restructuration Act to the courts. So if I go to my last uh, slide, Please, next slide, yeah. So the conclusion, when I, when I say the key takeaway is uh, maybe it's a good idea to have those protection schemes involved earlier uh, when we have to deal with the failure of an insurance. And you look at it with the, you know, the cross-border challenges, and I think the cross-border challenges within Canada and abroad, you know, Canada are similar. First issue that we have already heard about is that the resolvability awareness and acceptability it's more something that you know is well accepted in the banking industry and in the insurance industry. Uh, Jens referred to that earlier. You know, in the, uh, insurance is not banking. And I agree with that. But if if you want to to get someone be ready <laughs> to to deal with the uh, failure of an insurance company and the insurers are not that much interested yet to do that work, at least at the minimum, have your protection scheme getting ready earlier will help you know, uh, to compensate for the, the fact that the insurers themselves are not as ready uh, to, to, do, to, to do this uh, resolvability thinking than the banks are. Um, having more MOUs uh, and exchange of information is something that is critical. Uh, I won't go more into that, but another uh, helpful um, uh, help it brings to have the, the, uh, the uh, protection schemes earlier is in a jurisdiction like Canada where we don't have many failures. The problems we have is, um, uh, the, the flip side of that coin is that we don't have staff that have, you know, hands on experience on, on failures. So having those protection schemes earlier in the process helps us run simulation programs that involve those players and we get staff training opportunities and we can share lessons learned. And we do that internally in Canada, but we also have an international, international outreach so that we can learn from lessons uh, of others. And maybe a last point, uh, another twist to the ring fencing temptation uh, is when you have a conglomerate that fails, you will have many protection schemes that could be involved. So it's not just a, a, a jurisdiction fight to, to ring fence, it's within one jurisdiction, you can also have ring fencing among protection schemes. And well, having again, those people at the table earlier in the process would help to minimize and to split fairly the resolution cost. I thought I'd do it in six minutes. I'm sorry, I did it in nine, but uh, that's the fastest I could do, so.
Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. I'll turn the matter over to Justice Dick Nixon. Thank you, uh, Georgina. Uh, just by way of introduction, I'm Blair Nixon, uh, Justice on the Court of Queen's Bench of Alberta. We now turn to our final session today, which is insights from Africa and other emerging nations on financial institution recovery and resolution. I'm asked uh, my speakers just because of our time to see if we can keep it within 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, we have two speakers. First is Antonia uh, Menzies. Uh, Antonia is a senior financial sector specialist with the World Bank. In, uh, in particular, she is with the Insolvency and Debt Resolution Team uh, with that institution. And she focuses on providing technical assistance and advice to governments on insolvency and debt resolution reforms. Our second speaker is Professor John Pato. John is the John Philip Dawson Collegiate Professor of Law at the University of Michigan. John is internationally recognized expert in the field of bankruptcy and commercial law. His scholarship focuses on issues involved with the regulation of cross-border insolvencies. And both of our speakers are well published. I now turn the podium over to Antonia. Thank you for the introduction, Justice Nixon. So as you've heard, I am not in the World Bank Resolution Team. We do have a specific team that advises governments on putting bank resolution and recovery frameworks in place. I'm in the Global Insolvency Team. We assist governments in developing corporate and personal insolvency regimes. And my specific focus is on Africa, South Asia, and the Caribbean regions. The specific lens that I'm bringing today is looking at more detail on the legal aspects of non-performing loan management to strengthen the profitability of African banks and financial institutions. And I'll briefly discuss three areas. First of all, I'll highlight some of the key features of African bank resolution, um, of African bank banking systems and systemic risk that we're seeing currently in the region. Secondly, I'll look at some of the challenges that we're seeing with African bank resolution and recovery regimes. And finally, I'll focus on some of the tools that are currently being ramped up across Africa for dealing with high NPL levels and strengthening bank liquidity. If we could go to the next slide, please. So I think as you all know, there are diverse heterogeneous economies across the sub-Saharan Africa region, which mirrors the diversity of financial market development. For instance, there are large banking sectors in South Africa, Nigeria, and Angola, in contrast with small financial systems in countries such as Lesotho, Seychelles, and Benin. What we're seeing in Africa, even before the pandemic, is that non-performing loan levels are increasing around the region, which is impacting stability and the risk profile of the banking sector. These NPLs are expected to continue to rise in light of COVID-19. What you see here is 2017 IMF data, and it shows that Africa's non-performing loans total volume is estimated at 35 billion. In more than 30 countries, the NPL ratio is above 10%. Next slide, please. Some of the countries with the highest volume of NPLs are South Africa at 9.9 .9 billion, Angola, Nigeria, Kenya, and Ghana at 1.8 billion. High rates of NPLs are creating profitability issues for financial institutions, which can create system-wide challenges and bank stress that can negatively impact a country's financial system. Increases in NPLs, as we know, also place pressure on capital, constrain liquidity, and undermine credit growth as financial institutions tighten lending conditions. Next slide. Pan-African banks are expanding across the continent with subsidiaries in many countries. On one hand, these entities bring a lot of benefits such as a cross-border network and greater financial development. But on the other hand, in 2015, they were estimated to have a systemic presence in around 36 countries across the region, which increases systemic and cross-border contagion risk. 
These present new oversight challenges for regulators and supervisors, such as in relation to governance and cross-border resolution. So for instance, some countries have implemented Basel standards, others haven't. You might have some large PABs operating as subsidiaries of unregulated bank holding companies, etc. The rise of pan-African banks have amplified the need in Africa to establish resolution frameworks for systemic banks that are able to efficiently resolve these institutions at least cost for the state, including, including cross-border cooperation agreements between resolution authorities. As per the key attributes, if a jurisdiction is home to a bank that is required to undertake recovery and resolution planning and has operations in foreign jurisdictions that are material to the group, the Home Resolution Authority should make reasonable efforts to establish arrangements for cross-border cooperation and coordination. Next slide, please. A third feature that we're seeing in Africa is developments with the financial banking and payment services sectors. The usage of mobile money is expanding rapidly around the region, and I think Ignacio mentioned this this morning. According to the World Bank's 2014 Global Findex database, the 13 countries with the highest mobile money user bases as a proportion of population were all located in sub-Saharan Africa. And Kenya's mobile account penetration rate of 58.4% is the highest in the world. These innovations in the banking sector can pose challenges to pre-existing regulatory frameworks, such as with transparency, governance, and consumer protection. Next slide, please. So what are some of the key challenges with bank resolution regimes in Africa? And I should say that a lot of this information is taken from a survey that my colleagues ran in 2019, looking at bank resolution frameworks and financial safety nets in eight Southern African countries, Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Although a number of countries are considering strengthening financial safety nets and bank resolution regimes, such as Mozambique, Namibia, and South Africa, there are a number of challenges that countries face across the continent. First of all, some of the key preconditions to having an effective resolution and recovery regime in place might be lacking in Africa. So for instance, a well-established framework for financial stability, surveillance, and policy formulation, an effective system of supervision, regulation, and oversight of banks, effective deposit protection schemes, as we heard earlier, robust accounting, auditing, and disclosure regimes, and a well-developed legal framework and judicial system. Without these preconditions in place, implementing the key attributes is particularly challenging. Secondly, there are challenges in many countries with establishing an independent resolution authority. As we know, the FSB recommends that a resolution authority should be an independent agency or division within the central bank or supervision agency with an independent reporting line. Resource constraints are a big obstacle in many African countries. Our team's experience suggests that in Africa, a division within the central bank or supervision agency might be best because a lot of countries have cost constraints, um, difficulties in exchanging information with the supervisor, capacity outs with a lack of trained professionals. It's still important to ensure that it retains independence and is shielded from political and industry influences. In many countries, there's a lack of early warning indicators or early warning interventions, which are critical. So as we know, the earlier bank stress is detected and responded to, the greater is the prospect of restoring banks to financial soundness and avoiding the costs associated with bank failure. These early supervisory actions can range from suasion to more corrective sanctions, which are triggered when banks are deemed to be in danger of failing. Supervisory authorities should have systems in place to detect emerging stress in banks, such as routine off-site monitoring and on-site assessment processes. In Africa, what we've seen is that there is generally considerable scope to strengthen the capacity for the early detection of stress, such as through the, de the development of very clearly defined early warning indicators and stress testing arrangements. And then I'll just highlight another issue, which is um, that the frameworks for the resolution of non-viable banks still need improvement across sub-Saharan Africa. 
So several countries such as Nigeria, South Africa, and Mozambique are currently in the process of strengthening their resolution laws. However, bank resolution laws generally appear to lack clearly defined triggers for entry into resolution. So for example, based on the concept of non-viability, the laws also lack sufficient resolution powers with, which, with most of the countries in the region having, as you can see on the slide, only a relatively narrow range of, res of resolution tools available to deal with failing banks, such as temporary administration, recapitalization, mergers and liquidation. In most cases, existing law would leave governments with very little alternative but to bail out um, DSIB. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to highlight some of the tools that we're seeing in Africa, um, particularly at the moment, uh, for dealing with high levels of NPLs. I wanted to emphasize three tools where we are seeing increasing interest. Ultimately, high NPLs lead to bank stress that can undermine the stability of a country's financial sector. The first one is asset management companies, AMCs. Um, they're one tool in the resolution framework. And in normal times, banks and financial institutions should be able to manage their NPLs. However, a more direct intervention may be warranted where level of non-performing assets through the system is high and threatens the stability of the financial system, or banks are unwilling to recognize their losses due to thin capital positions, or the legislative framework, for instance, for debt enforcement is weak and can't accommodate a large number of cases. AMCs can be a bank resolution entity if many institutions need to exit, or they can be asset purchasing entities to allow banks to continue to operate more profitably. And we acknowledge that AMCs can be beneficial. They can force banks to recognize their losses and help to restore confidence in the system. The use of cash or a coupon paying government guaranteed security to purchase non-performing assets may improve asset quality and provide badly needed income to financial institutions. And the financial system is strengthened by restructuring weak but viable banks and removing those that are not viable. This slide shows the logos for two public AMCs in Africa right now, Amcon in Nigeria and Zamco in Zimbabwe, and one private AMC in Uganda, the assets reconstruction company created by the Uganda Bankers Association to facilitate NPLs. And I want to emphasize that there are several challenges with AMCs. They've been used to store non-performing assets at book value, resulting in high costs for the state. There's no actual workout. Even if there are workouts of non-performing assets, there are no buyers because the market is stale and so investors are not coming in. There's often a lack of capacity or asset management skills. And a lot of the legislation underpinning the AMCs can have drafting issues. For instance, a lack of a sunset clause or very weak governance provisions. What we've seen is that in many countries, AQRs can show problems with the underlying security. Um, so for instance, poor security valuations. In one country where I was working, the government wanted to set up an AMC to deal with NPLs, but after their AQR, they realized that most of the NPL portfolio was already in enforcement or insolvency proceedings, and they couldn't pull those portfolios out of the court without due process or constitutionality concerns being flagged. And finally, in the resolution process, it's important to ensure that the first parties to bear the losses are the shareholders of the, of the distressed firm. So transferring bad assets to an AMC, but leaving the distressed bank in the hands of the original shareholders is not normally uh, uh, an ideal resolution approach. Next slide, please. I'm not gonna spend time on this. I know we're running um, out of time, but we are seeing an increased demand from governments and emerging markets to put workout frameworks in place to help them work out NPLs. And as you know, these can be voluntary or hybrid frameworks. I would just highlight the challenges that we're seeing in Africa. So pure voluntary guidelines can be challenging. If banks are not accustomed to discussing restructuring together, then having a framework doesn't mean that they're going to do that. There are often limitations on tax write-offs, which can impede the restructuring process. Um, particularly if the tax authorities are holding a lot of debt, this can be problematic. And it's very important for uh, workout regimes to be incorporated in overall NPL governance frameworks. 
Next slide, please. And the last tool I want to emphasize is that there is increasing interest in Africa right now to develop distressed asset markets in order to quickly dispose of problem assets. The IFC arm of the World Bank is our private sector investment arm, and IFC DARP is a global platform that focuses on the acquisition and resolution of distressed assets across emerging markets. Uh, this has many benefits. For instance, it allows financial institutions to offload their NPLs and free up capital to resume lending. Over the, uh, over the past 10 years, IFC has committed $7.3 billion in distressed assets in emerging markets. And what we're seeing is that governments are increasingly interested in understanding how distressed asset investing works. For instance, we're helping them establish electronic NPL trading platforms. There are many challenges surrounding this area, however, for instance, weak regulatory regimes. So investors really want to know that they'll only come into a country if they'll be able to recover. So um, I hope that that gives you an overview of some of the issues in Africa, and I'll turn it over to John now to look at some other regions in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Antonia. Uh, John, if uh, you could take the platform now. Oh, okay. I will happily do so. Um, Justice Nixon, can you hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up or something if it's working. I can hear you fine, sir. Thank you. Splendid. Uh, let me talk for just a few minutes, uh, summarizing some of the emerging market materials. Um, I think Antonio did a great job talking about Africa already. Now, um, I want to show the difficulty with assessing the um, the tools used by these countries. So if you look at this quantitative thing on the first slide there, you see a range of 40 to 7% 40 to compliance with the key attributes, which um, could suggest an expected value there of 55. But if you go to the next slide, please, um, you'll see quite a lot of difficult to read print, which suggests that there's heterogeneity of compliance. And so um, two observations from this chart, it's high compliance to low compliance along the vertical axis and the horizontal axis is the different uh, tools that are used. Uh, number one is I was unable to detect a pattern of the compliance levels based on region or economy. So I'm gonna say it's uh, presumptively haphazard. And number two, uh, was that there are certain modalities that are not used yet um, as these uh, nations move towards compliance. Particularly, I wanted to draw attention to the bail-in uh, um, tool. The bail-in tool appears to be adopted so far by tentatively no one, um, although this uh, information may be out of date. So there's something about bail-in that um, is anxiety-inducing, and I found this in India as well. In fact, the bail-in procedures were so controversial that they killed the Indian um, uh, reform plan for their bank resolution scheme. Um, going down to the next level, it's also hard to say whether plans mean plans or not, because when you try to use just summary tables like dummy statistics, yes or no, we have a plan regime in place, um, the specificity and vagueness of that varies considerably amongst jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So I have anxiety about the um, validity of this uh, information on Africa. The other thing that does not appear to be widely implemented is no worse off protection. So I guess there's no no worse off um, uh, regimes there in Africa. Uh, positive note is that uh, notwithstanding this compliance with the key attributes, there is the rise, as, as Antonio pointed out, of pan-African institutions, which might be um, filling some sort of uh, supervisory role that even exceeds or complements the national jurisdictions. If we could go into the next slide, please. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, with massive ignorance on Latin America. Um, again, you have a nice uh, chart there. This is information going back to 2016, um, uh, showing what uh, regimes have been put in place, what tools. But again, look at if you can see, look at the chart under resolution tools with the little um, check marks and red boxes, and you'll see, you know, uh, lovely um, asset separation agreements there. Bail-in gets collectively no real collection, uh, no real buy-in on the, uh, on the um, tools there as well. So uh, why is bail-in so controversial? I have no idea. I will say this on the Latin American context is that in the 80s and 90s crises, they already built up a certain resilience um, in their systems already, so have weathered bank failures pretty well. Um, I'll just run through and give you a comment on maybe a couple of jurisdictions. Brazil is going through a 2019 reform um, 
uh, legislation that's being considered. Um, what's interesting, I think, about the 2019 Brazil one, and I'll defer to people who have greater information, is that it includes a bailout provision, uh, which some of you may find um, an interesting development. It's supposed to only be used as a last resort. So to the extent that bail-in is inducing anxiety, we now have the potential for codified bailout. Um, Brazil does have cooperation agreements with UK and Spain, um, but a lot of the other Latin American ones, like for example, Mexico, uh, as a G20 member says, we don't have cooperation regimes yet uh, because we don't have uh, global CIFIs or whatever the banking analog definition is in that regime. Um, in the Brazil uh, 2019 legislation that's going to try to segment between big and small, which I guess is an analog for CIFIs and non CIFIs. Let me talk about Chile for 30 seconds to 60 seconds. Um, the superintendent of bankruptcy has also been subsumed with a recent uh, financial sector reform uh, bill there that creates a larger institution called the Commission on Financial Markets. And so supervising and resolution authority is going to be put in there. And the AMID is going to be, it's not going to be bank specific. It's going to look at all aspects of their financial markets. Um, very Basel III compliant, uh, trying to uh, raising their TLAC requirements, et cetera. It almost looks like a mind line, like Chile is trying to be a virtue signal or a, of, of a poster child of reform for these resolution authorities. So very much trying to follow what the best practices are. Um, Mexico seems to reform their laws every couple of years. So I find it difficult to keep up with um, the uh, main thing in Mexico was the most recent legislation that I found is trying to wrestle with the issue of creditor hierarchy, putting that specifically into their resolution and recovery thing, uh, which may or may not take along with it a um, an idea of no worse off. Uh, I tried to look at Argentina to see if anything about their financial crisis would affect their bank resolution. Everything is run through the central bank in Argentina, so everything from macroeconomic policy to bank failure. Um, the IMF loan is, is, as many of you will know, is being renegotiated. So I don't know if that will shore up banks or not. Argentina has what's been described as a very shallow financial sector. It's very bank based, very locally based. Uh, I apologize for the speed at which I'm going through, but the last thing I wanted to say about Latin America is all of their regimes, starting back from the 80s, I guess is the advantage of having financial crises early on, have um, deposit insurance schemes, which are pretty prevalent. I did not see that in the African context. If you'll indulge me, and we can go into the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about, um, uh, no, skip that one, go into the next one, please. I want to talk a little bit about India. Um, India uh, has had two ma massive financial failures, real Yes Bank and uh, DA. FL, which is a mortgage lender. India does not have this sort of regulation regime and everything's going through um, the courts and insolvency. Uh, the state banks of India are largely involved in the investments in their financial sector. So it's difficult to disentangle um, what we would consider in the states private banks from uh, private e financial institutions where there's a lot of um, state involvement. Um, the political landscape in India, uh, there was a, a, a legislation introduced in 2017 for a bank resolution uh, regime. Previously, the Reserve Bank of India had sort of schemes and frameworks that were promulgated of how to resolve uh, financial institutions. And then I think got derailed by the passage of the 2016 insolvency code in India which divided debtors into operating debtors and financial debtors. And this is my speculation, maybe took the heat off the Reserve Bank of India and they said, oh, we don't have to do anything anymore. Um, so that stopped. Um, but what the legislation in 2017 that was gonna set up a resolution authority, and I have a slide on that later on, which I'll show you, but it got pulled um, largely in a controversy over um, bail in and a concern that there would not be sufficient protection for depositors. Um, now what the Yes Bank failure and the DHFL pay, just an idea of the Yes Bank um, failed. There was, this is a picture uh, next to it of Rana Kapoor, who was the second richest man in India, who's now in jail, um, had lots of massively fraudulent um, uh, transactions. And when they uh, tried to ad hoc restructure this because there wasn't a, a strong resolution system. They they appointed it a sort of administrator who tried to run it basically the way you would do uh, a bank resolution with a little bit of a 363 sale, if I may use an American terminology of trying to sell off the assets. And um, uh, after its uh, plans were rejected by creditors, uh, largely because I think the financial creditors didn't want to take write downs of non performing loans. Um, they decided to package the assets for sale and had 24 expressions of interest back in February um, from real big players like Oak Tree and Bain and KKR. And then COVID hit and the whole sales thing fell apart. Um, 
I apologize. I apologize. That's DHFL. I'm crossing up my Indian financial institutions. Yes Bank, what they did was they tried to put out an expression of interest for sales and no one wanted to invest the money. So the state institutions had to pump money in and now own about 49% of it. And they've put in lockup agreements. They, it's, it's styled as a public part, private partnership, but truthfully, the public is the tail wagging the dog. And uh, the uh, private investors are locked up for a period of three years. Um, so what that means is uh, it's being floated up with false liquidity for three years. And we'll see what happens if there's a massive sell off, but the uh, capital markets seem to be buying it because it's trading. Okay, next slide, and I'll conclude within the next minute or so. Uh, DHFL was the third largest um, mortgage lender in India. They tried to put together a consensual plan, which was voted down by creditors. As I said, it didn't even get 30% of the vote. So then it went into administration and they're trying to sell off its assets right now. It's still operating. It's still operating as a, as a lender. Um, but the uh, sales process was put on hold as of the COVID outbreak. And an auditor just came out this, this month saying lots of accounting and regulated there. So I don't know. Final slide, please. Uh, the, that is the section 52, which had the bail-in provision, which killed the 2017 legislation. Um, I can't tell if it's a suggestion that it's the protection is um, only up to the deposit amount. So there's concern that depositors might not be protected or might even be subordinated beyond their deposit guarantee insurance or if it's the lack of a no worse off principle, but something made um, the Indian uh, polity uh, anxious about protection of deposit holders, so this died, but subsequently with the failure of DHFC and DHFL and Yes Bank, there's been renewed political pressure, so there's a big speech given by one of the reserve governors of India just this past summer saying we need to enact legislation for resolution, this is not working ad hoc, so maybe this will come back. And with that, I conclude and apologize for the quickness of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Antonia and John, for your insightful presentations. I'd like to now turn the podium over to Dr. Morava, who will introduce our closing speaker. Thank you. Thank you to welcome our final keynote speaker, Dr. Eva Hupkes. Dr. Hupkes is the head of regulatory and supervisory policies at the FSB. She will focus in her speech on the FSB key attributes and what has changed since they were first adopted and introduced after the crisis. Over to you, Eva. Let me talk about the um, Financial Stability Board's key attributes, why they were adopted and what difference they made. And since I'm not sure everybody is equally familiar with the Financial Stability Board, uh, let me say a few words about it. Uh, the FSB was established by the G20 at the London summit in 2009. The G20 then transformed the then existing Financial Stability Forum that has been set up by the G7 following the financial crisis in Asia into a new body with a broader mandate and broader representation, um, including in particular from emerging market economies. In 2011, the FSB uh, issued the key attributes of effective resolution regimes for financial institutions, and these were endorsed by the G20 as a new international standard on the resolution of systemically important financial institutions. The key attributes set out powers and tools authorities should have, and importantly, um, they not only cover banks, but also insurers and financial uh, market infrastructures. And I was very pleased to see that at the colloquium also covered financial market infrastructures. Um, so yesterday, Mark Lemieux talked about this and today, Monica Marucci and Professor Jens Gahl talked about insurance resolution. So the key attributes are cross sectoral. They call for the establishment of a designated administrative authority or authorities for exercising resolution powers. Um, and uh, that authority should have the mandate to resolve the firm that is no longer viable in a manner that maintains the critical economic functions that it performs. So important objectives are preserving financial stability, protecting depositors and um, uh, insurance policyholders, uh, and minimizing the overall cost of resolution. So they also set out uh, uh, standards for a subset of global systemically important banks, the GSIPs, um, and there is 
each November, the FSB publishes of a list of GSIPs that are designated. An important power is the bail-in power that was um, mentioned before. It should enable authorities to write down liabilities or convert them into equ equity to support a creditor finance recapitalization. And to exercise the bail-in power, there need to be bail liabilities, so liabilities that can be converted and written down. And, and that may also be uh, well, the issue here. We heard before the speaker well, uh, mentioned that the bail power is not available in many jurisdictions, and it's not really usable with respect to a mainly deposit-taking bank unless uh, one wants to bail in depositors, which is um, not uh, well the intent actually of the key attributes. That's why the FSB set up this requirement for the total loss absorbing capacity, the TLAC standards, that uh, requires at least the largest bank to maintain a certain amount of bailable resources at all times that then can facilitate a recapitalization of the bank. So the FSB guidance on um, a resolution on the implementation of the key attributes, um, and they were adopted, and I think um, we heard it yesterday from Don Bernstein, to avoid a disorderly Lehman-style insolvency that could lead to great destruction of value, contagion, and threaten financial um, stability. So in the absence of any alternatives, governments may have little choice but to intervene in the, in the case of distress of a bank, um, use public funds to bail uh, that bank out. And the knowledge that a bank may be bailed out represents an implicit government subsidy, which can have implications for the behavior of banks and markets. And creditors may be more willing to fund a, a bank at lower rates and um, be more insen insensitive to credit risk of the borrower. So this tendency moral hazard may cause substantial economic distortions. So the global uh, community adopted a two-pronged strategy that is measures to reduce the probability of failure, but also measures to reduce the impact of failure through effective um, resolution um, regimes in order to uh, uh, shield taxpayers from losses. So have the reforms achieved their objectives? Are financial institutions resolvable? The FSB has been monitoring the implementation of the key attributes ever since they were adopted. And we found substantial progress in particular in jurisdictions that are home to GSIPs. Almost all GSIPs have resolution regimes in place. And for GSIPs in particular, there is a new paradigm around resolution planning, the establishment of crisis management groups underpinned by institution-specific cooperation agreements and regular resolvability assessments. Also, um, substantial amounts of TLAC have been issued and uh, the structures uh, have been uh, more closely aligned with resolution strategies. There is, it has been an exante identification of resolution entities. So which are the entities that are likely to enter resolution? Which subsidiaries can rely on the parent to act as a source of strength? Uh, the majority of GSIPs have adopted the single point of entry strategy as their preferred resolution strategy but others have um, also um, gone for a multiple point of entry strategy. Have the reforms achieved their objective of addressing the moral hazard risk? Well, this is a question that the FSB um, examined as part of its evaluation of the effects of too big to fail reforms. The FSB recently issued a consultative report um, and uh, uh, concludes in that report that the reforms actually appear to be working, um, that indicators for systemic risk and moral hazard have fallen, that um, resolution regimes now do provide authorities with a much wider range of options to deal with banks in distress, and, and also that uh, reforms are seen as credible by market participants. So there are lower to be to fail subsidies um, and 
that does imply higher funding costs for banks, but uh, lower costs, presumably, for the taxpayer. What have we learned from this evaluation? Um, well, when we uh, are learning how the system works, we're also learning how it can be further improved. And uh, let me maybe briefly mention four lessons. Uh, first is resolution only works if market participants believe that it will. So if we want to make market participants truly believe that authorities will place a firm into a resolution rather than bail it out, there needs to be more information available about the firm's resolvability, both the, um, the bail-in strategy, the ranking of instruments in the insolvency hierarchy. This is uh, one of the key findings of the Tobik to fail evaluation. Second lesson, the reforms are very much focused on GSIB, so global systemically important banks, so there are around 30 of them. Um, and the TLAC requirements of the FSB only apply to those banks. Same for the CMG, the Crisis Management Group requirements, the requirement for cooperation agreements. So, however, however, we have seen a number of uh, systemically important banks fail. And when you look at the annex, into the annex of the typically fail evaluation report, you actually find a list of um, these failures and also um, instances where government stepped in to um, they recap to bright funds for um, capitalization. A third lesson echoes one uh, that Don mentioned. It relates to the uh, distribution of resources in a group during good times and the ability to deploy those re resources flexibly in times of stress. Uh, here I'm referring to internal TLAC. Internal TLAC prepositioning um, is to provide incentives for home and host cooperation and ensure that the critical operation of a firm can continue in a crisis. So um, for that reason, the TLAC is actually not a requirement for all subsidiaries and host jurisdiction, but primarily for those material operations so that these um, can be uh, maintained. However, there is um, a limited amount of resources. Not everything should be uh, pre-positioned. There should be resources that are freely, um, um, that can be distributed across a group. At the same time, um, we also know that uh, losses are, the allocation, the losses fall in a symmetric way and uh, that, um, well, the, the distribution of uh, loss absorbing cap capacity remains one of the key challenges in our cross border resolution. And finally, uh, a lesson, a yeah, positive lesson from the past crisis and the current COVID crisis is that um, where the cooperation and uh, coordination has worked fairly well. Also, information, um, there's been much more information available on the uh, soundness of financial institutions. However, uh, we also learned um, uh, the episode, again, reconfirmed that financial institutions require liquidity to continue to operate their critical functions. So a key question that is um, relevant or equally or even more relevant uh, than the distribution of um, capital instruments is that of um, access to liquidity across a group. So uh, to conclude, are we prepared? Well, the massive increase of debt um, in the wake um, of the COVID crisis makes it timely to ask whether we are prepared. Uh, resolution preparedness clearly remains a key priority. The COVID uh, pandemic confirmed that the importance of ongoing work on resolvability, including in particular also for our central counterparties. Financial institutions entered the crisis in a more resilient state than they did the 2008 financial crisis. And this is thanks, at least in part, to resolution planning capabilities for monitoring the financial condition of firms and for cooperation and communication amongst authorities have much improved and this has served authorities well. While we've made much progress, there is reason to not become complacent. 
To date, we have focused primarily on banks. However, going forward, we need to make sure that resolution regimes and planning extend to all types of firms and infrastructures that could be systemic in failure, notably CCPs, systemic insurers, systemically important banks, and maybe in the more distant future, also new entrants into the financial system from the fintech world. Let me stop here. I hope you could uh, follow me all the way through my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. <laughs> Bukes, uh, for, for uh, these insightful remarks uh, and generally for joining us at this event. Sorry for the connection issues. Perhaps you could also send us your remarks and we can circulate them uh, to everyone if you don't mind. Anyway, sure. uh, we hope uh, to continue discussing our ideas with you as we progress with our uh, project. Uh, if I can also now thank everyone who attended and commented, spoke, moderated, or took the time to reflect and think about uh, the problem of financial institution resolution, and especially to thank uh, Dr. Gianni Serra and the Peter Allard School of Law and the Business Law Center, especially Helen, Joan, and Charles for, as always, executing a cutting edge exceptional event. Thank you all.